Blending up fun, freshly frozen beverages from shakes and smoothies to bowls and cocktails has never been easier than the For Real by Riches back of house blender. Simply grab a For Real by Riches frozen base cup, place it in a blender, and press start for hands-free, mess-free blending in under a minute. Customize or serve it as is. It's that easy. Learn more about For Real by Riches at richesusa.com slash for real dash food service. Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nation's Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief here at NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all-access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with Andrew Smith, the managing partner of Savory Fund, a Utah-based private equity firm that counts 10 emerging restaurant brands in its portfolio. I've talked with several of Andrew's brand leaders here on the podcast, There's a good chance that you've heard me talk with Andrew either on stage at Create or during one of our Emerging Restaurateur live learning series webinars. Uh, But this is the first time he has joined an episode of Takeaway. Uh, As such, we could have talked for hours and hours on a range of topics, uh, but I specifically wanted for Andrew to join the podcast so we could discuss the state of restaurant investing and our upcoming investment summit in Nashville, for which Savory Fund is a valued partner. Andrew is a phenomenal resource for emerging restaurant leaders, and we discussed whether now is a good time to raise money and what founders must do as they prep their brands for a raise. In this interview, you will learn more about why it's better to be a speedboat in tumultuous waters than a cruise ship, why you have to date around when you're raising money, and why your foundation must be strong before a raise. Of course, if you like what you hear in this interview, you can access much, much more at the Investment Summit this October 8th through 9th in Nashville. This event helps us kick off Create the Event for Emerging Restaurateurs, which is October 9th through 11th, and you only have to register once for free to access both of these events. The Investment Summit is an amazing opportunity for restaurant founders and small chain leaders to get face-to-face access to now 25 investors, and other financial firms who can help you navigate the journey of a capital raise. Andrew will be moderating a session on private equity, plus we also have sessions on other sources of financing, how to craft your dream deal, and a keynote conversation with the leaders of walk-ons, small sliders, and their capital partner, 10 Point Capital. We wrap the summit with two hours of roundtable networking, the perfect opportunity to meet with potential investors. Register for free by going to create.nrn.com. Jumping now into my interview with Savory Fund's Andrew Smith. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my five takeaways from this discussion, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. All right, I'm sitting down with Andrew Smith, managing partner for Savory Fund. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sam. Great to be here today. Andrew, I realized that um, I, I talk to you all the time uh, because you are such a fount of wisdom for this industry, but I've not had you on the podcast, so I, I wanted to change that. So uh, my apologies that I've done a podcast now for uh, several years, and this is your first time on it. But You're forgiven. We've talked enough. Okay. You, I, I appreciate that. You'll still try your best on this episode, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, Andrew, we're a few weeks out from the Investment Summit. Um, Savory Fund is a great partner of ours, helped us launch this event last year as part of our Create event. Um, This year, second year, bigger and better. Um, October 8th through 9th, we're bringing over 20 investors to Nashville. Uh, We have already over 100 operators from emerging restaurants who are joining us to learn about uh, investment and raising capital to grow your business. Um, Savory, once again, one of our valued partners in this. Um, And I just wanted to get a little bit of a a preview of what to expect. To start things, Andrew, um, tell me a little bit more about the state of things, because we were talking before we hit record that it's kind of ugly out there right now. You're hearing lots about bankruptcies and closures, um, you know, inflation's cooling, rates uh, expect to hopefully come down. But if you were to take a look at things as far as an investment standpoint and capital, you know, where where would you say we stand? Yeah, it's a good question. But before I start that, when you say we're going to go bigger and better in Nashville, I don't know. We were at the top of a mountain last That's year. True. Right? That's true. We, we came all the way down now. <laughs> yeah, we went down to go up and go bigger. It's crazy. That's a good point. And I'm so excited to do it in Nashville. I mean, Nashville is such a hotbed right now. I think that brands that are opening there, you know, there's mixed bag results depending on where you drop in Nashville. But Nashville itself, such an entertaining city, such a vibrant city. 
and it's really going through evolution, I think, with uh, with who they are too. It used to be just you know honky tonk lane there with all the the Western, and now it's really becoming this this incredible so uh, society of restaurants and retail, and it's a really cool place. So I'm I'm excited about Create this year and and uh, being your partner on Investment Summit. I, I would also say this that when I say evolve um, with with Nashville, I feel like that's what's happening within the industry. I feel like yeah. we're going through this evolution and. I think some people know in this industry, those that, that don't know this, but I was in the tech industry, Sam, and, and I was in it through the dot-com bubble and then the 2008 crash as well. And we were forced in those times to evolve. Things completely changed like within two months. And both of those times when the market crashed that we all had to evolve, like what's the new world look like? And I think within food and beverage, you know, we say that we're non-correlated to markets, right? When the market crashes, you and I, Sam, and everybody else has to wake up still and we have to eat. We, we can't say, well, because the market's down and my portfolio's in the trash, I'm not going to go eat. You're going to go eat. But we are correlated more to the markets when inflation hits you, when interest rates are high, when you have less discretionary spend, when jobless claims are going up, people think they're going down, they're actually up, so there's more people that are unemployed. When all of those things hit at the same time, you, you are correlated because you have less money in the wallet. So I, I believe that the industry right now as a whole, everybody feels it. I don't even have to say it. We feel the pressure from all sides of our life. And that's that's justifying probably the slowdown in traf traffic, the slowdown in, in, in same store sales for most of us. And we're all fighting you know, tooth and nail to get those back up. But I do believe it's gonna be another 12 months before we see more healthy numbers for, for the industry as in general, Sam, coming back to where we want it to be. I think we're evolving back to what the new state's going to be. It's going to be another year in my mind. Sure. All right. So when you look at a, a savory fund as a private equity group, you guys are making strategic investments um, and building a portfolio. You guys have are, are doing a wonderful job at this. Uh, many successful concepts, of course, that our listeners will be familiar with. Um, Swig, of course, uh, being a part of the um, por portfolio. Mo Betas, uh, Pincho, Via 313. I can go on and on. Um, uh, when you look at the market today, because you guys continue to look for investments, um, sure. what are you looking for? What what is what makes a good deal for you as the investor today? It's a great question because in times of difficulty, when you think about even when we hit through the 2020 21 time, which everybody knows what that was, I won't have to say it, but when we went through this big shift in the world, it, it actually makes the winners stand out more. So mm -hmm. for us, when trying times happen. We actually look for those that galvanize as a team and then they can punch through what, they're, what the, the rest of the industry is dealing with. Some people you know, are really set up for failure already going into a tough time because they might be over levered. They don't have the right debt structure. They're not capitalized the right way. They might not have the right unit level economics to where they can actually survive kind of a, down and, a downward trend in, in traffic and sales. But during this time, we look for brands that are, are prevailing. And guess what, Sam? There's a lot of brands prevailing. There are, and I, I think people are only hearing the negative, but the benefit that Savory has is we literally review about 400 brands a year, 400. That's a wow. lot. We're doing yeah. them every day, every week. We have a whole team that are talking to brands that are inbound saying, hey, you know, we might be too small or whatever, but can you take a look and tell us what you think? And what we're seeing with a lot of these brands is, man, there are some really, really uh, passionate, smart and gritty founders out there that are finding a way to navigate these tumultuous waters that we're in. And that's really cool for Savory to see because the American dream is full alive and well, even in a tough market, because people mm -hmm. figure it out. And that goes back to this whole evolution thing, Sam. People are evolving through this crappy time right now to become something unique. And I think a brand that's big, kind of dilapidated, older, the Titanic, they can't shift as fast as these guys that are in speedboats trying to figure it out. And I think the guys in the speedboats are figuring things out. They just are. Yeah. Well, and when we, uh, you know, you and I had conversations initially last year that led to the investment summit. And, you know, it was that conversation about how do you put the leaders of the speedboats, if you will, into a room with some of the investors that can give them a, a stronger motor, if you uh, want to stick yeah. with that analogy. Um, and that's what the investment summit has become about, has been to say, you know, leaders of brands with five, 10, 20 units, whatever, however big you are, um, if you're in that stage where you want to raise capital for growth, the investment summit's the place for you. Um, and so for those who are listening who are interested in that and they want to be a part of it, um, what do you say to those who are wondering if it's time for a raise? How, how do you know it's time for a raise? What are some of the indicators you should look at? 
Yeah, well, first and foremost, the reason why I partner with you is because Savory, unfortunately, is not a trillion dollar fund and I can't fund everybody, right? And I, I would love to help everybody and I can't. And, you know, people would think that was crazy and so would my other counterparts probably think it would be crazy to be involved in a summit where you have all these different investors come together. You would think that we would all like pull out our knives and start knife fighting, right? <laughs> and that's not how it is. And I think that, Sam, you've really done a good job pulling together this investment summit idea, which is let us help everybody that's thinking about a capital raise now or will be thinking about a capital raise in the future. Let us help them and let them have, let, let's have an opportunity for them to meet multiple. Because the one thing about raising money is you have to date a lot. And I tell people all the time, it's like, you didn't marry your wife if she was the first person you ever met. And I'm sure some people have, but you know, you're gonna get into this long-term relationship. I, I say date, date several, get to know many, court several, and figure out which one matches what your psyche is on growth and on, on uh, you know, developing your brand across the country. So I, I love the idea of the investment summit for the sole purpose that we collectively together as partners on this are giving so many uh, merging brands opportunities to not only rub shoulders, but also to learn, learn mm -hmm. the vernacular, learn what questions to ask, what not to ask, and what their brand has to look like to even uh, know that they should raise money. So back to your question, you know, raising money, everybody thinks raising money is for covering up losses or refinancing debt or, you know, saving the day. And mm -hmm. I would just say, don't go raise money if you're trying to save the day, because raising money right now is extremely hard. Mm. And when I say it's extremely hard, the investors that have money are going to be more picky. Mm -hmm. So if you're picky as an investor, you're not going to look for the projects that you have to buy and turn them around or the fix it jobs or the turnarounds or the ones that have too much debt that you have to go restructure with the bank. They're going to look at the ones that are a little bit easier and are, you know, there's there's a path of least resistance for them to get involved and then for you guys to work work together. If you're in that scenario right now, it is time to buckle down and fix and smooth out those rough edges of your business. You gotta just hunker down. Don't worry about growth. Don't worry about, my brand's great, but it's not healthy enough to grow. Well, then don't grow right now. Don't go raise money. Mm -hmm. Get your house in order and, and make sure that your foundation is nice and strong. If it's a strong base and you have a business that you believe you're doing it better than those that are in the same segment, you have an edge on entertainment or economics or leadership or culture or vibe or whatever it is that you think you have better than your competition and your your foundation is strong you are a raised candidate you mm -hmm. should go raise right now because i would say this too i got in this industry from the tech industry uh sam in 2009 like it was right in the middle of the recession and people were like wow that's like the worst time to get into this market i beg to differ i actually thought that it was the best time sam because mm -hmm. 2009 2010 2011 and even into 12 because the recession lasted so long back then it was the best time to be growing. Mm. You've got to be ready for growth when times are tough. Well, land might be less expensive. Real estate might come down in, in price. You might have less cost in labor. You might. So because that water kind of comes down on costs across the board, that's the time you want to be armed up for growth. And so I would say to those that, that have a good business, now is the time to raise because the next three to four years feel to me like 9, 10, 11, 12. That's a great point. And to unpack that a little bit, you know, <laughs> Um, I think we spoke a few years ago, it might've been in the, in the, the thick of the pandemic and it was trying to really understand, you know, investors were on the sidelines, keeping the powder dry, right? Because what? it was, just, everybody just wanted to get through it. And then, and we had this sort of assumption that, you know, I think it was back in 21, we're like, well, 22, you know, 23, that's going to be the year, right? And then it was all well, 24, that's going to be the year. And I'm wondering, I mean, is it simply inflation keeping investors back? What, what's going to get investors to be more interested in making those investments? Yeah, the thing that is, number one, what you just said is actually right. Everybody's trying to time the market. And mm -hmm. if you talk to any good investor, listen, you had Warren Buffett on this call right now, which would be amazing, right? Like we could talk to Warren. Yeah, awesome. but, <laughs> but if we had Warren Buffett on right now, he would just say, don't try to time the market. Like you, you, it, it's a it's a fool's errand to try to figure out, like, I'm going to put it in here and I'm going to sell it at this point because I'm going to time the market. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the world or the market. All you can do is your best work to make sure that you you grow discipline. So as fast as you should, but not too fast. You should mm -hmm. have the right team, but not too much team. But at the end of the day, you you have to be a business that has profits because you're not going to ever survive this unless you actually have profits, number one. Right. So make sure you have profitable business and business metrics, but leaning into the next couple of years, you actually have to have a business that is, um, I think is resilient as ever been 
because during the COVID era and the pandemic, I think everybody was winning because people were sitting at home, they weren't cooking, so they were just ordering, right? Yeah. Now, there's so much competition because people are growing fast, thinking that fast speed and growth is what's going to attract an investor to come put the money in to then grow even faster. But right now, the fundamentals of the business are what we're all looking at. Mm -hmm. If you have a business that is low in profits, you're probably gonna turn away everybody right now. And so it's not the time to grow. So the fundamentals in business right now are, you still have to be a profitable business and you have to figure out a way or you're not gonna attract any investor. That's just the bottom line. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, so, okay, of course, Savory Fund uh, representing private equity. Um, make the case for private equity. Why would, if I am the leader of an emerging restaurant chain, I wanna grow, I'm out to raise some capital. Why a private equity fund such as Savory? Yeah, you know, I woke up every single day during the pandemic and I, I was calm about it. I, I knew it was going to pass. I knew we were going to work through it somehow. I knew the world would work through it and because bad times always pass. And one of the things that kept me really comfortable is that I didn't have a bunch of debt service. So I, I didn't have um, all of my different brands, my founder partners, because we're founder partner led, like we, we want to make sure our founders are involved. They slept okay at night too, because they knew that we didn't have a business that was generating $20 million in revenue and we had 12, 15, $20 million of debt, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to like wake up every day, like how are we going to make enough money today in our business to service the payment on the loans at the end of the month and rent and our bills and our employees and, 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 and. So an equity raise and doing that with private equity, it comes in in a structured way that takes and removes the pressure of debt service off because they're long-term holders and they're not expecting payments today. Any type of debt that you take on right now, it's usually high interest rate or it's principal and interest. And that just is a cash suck to a business. So if you're growing, it's always best to do it with equity. So private equity or equity from someone that invests into your business for mm -hmm. growth. When you have a sustained business though, this is the big catch right here, Sam. If you have a sustained business where fundamentals are good, systems, process, people are in place and you have a very, uh, a, a profitable but good cash flowing asset of, of stores, you should then use debt to then f uh, uh, fund your next set of growth. But until you have that, equity is the way to go to get to a point where you have plenty of cash flow and then don't over lever that cash flow. Our, our theory is two, maybe three times what you make in EBITDA a year is probably the max debt you should have. And if you have a business that's kicking off $2 million, of EBITDA and you have $15 million of debt, Sam, you're upside down. That's not gonna yeah. be a good feeling for you. And if you hiccup as a business, inflation hits you a little bit more, sales come down a little bit and your margins go from 18% to 12%, you're probably in big trouble. So don't right. have debt like that. So private equity is always to take away the pressure of current pay. Because if you think that a bank is not, is not a partner or an equity partner, they are. They have your whole business tied up and if Sam, you and I own a business together and we go sell a business for $50 million and we're like, we just made $25 million each, but you have $30 million of debt. No, you didn't. We both made $10 million each because you still got to pay them. <laughs> so people think that debt, there's no dilution there. Mm -hmm. Well, between you and I, we could have made 25 each if we had raised you know, equity and you were the equity partner and I was the founder. But if you have a bunch of debt, you still have to pay off the debt. So right. people look at debt the wrong way, like there's no dilution it's still implied dilution to a founder. Just right. think of it that way. No, that's great. That's a great way to explain it. And, and to that point, the investment summit, we're going to have many different types of investors. So uh, we're also going to have representatives from family office, uh, venture capital, um, private credit, uh, something I want to explore with you because you pointed me in this direction, um, uh, debt financing, um, lots of different people with lots of different walks. And we don't need to walk through and, you know, explain all of them. But um, in general, with so many options that are in front of the founder, the, the brand leader, um, you know, what should be going through their mind as they're choosing those? I mean, if they're thinking, well, maybe not private equity for whatever reason, uh, you know, maybe I want to go with family office, for example, mm -hmm. or, or private credit, like what, what should be some of the things that are shaping that decision? Yeah, it's a, again, it's a personality match and it's also what your needs are. So with family offices, because we have those as a lot of our investors in our fund, and then we have also some partners in our brands where they've uh, acquired Larry H. Miller Corporation bought the majority of Swig and I work with them very carefully or very closely. Um, you know, 
that that made sense for Swig because of what they wanted to do with the business, and that matched what the founder and Savory wanted to do with the business, and our 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 values aligned, and that was very very important. Now, did they bring this deep bench of food and beverage experience? No, because at the time we didn't need that. We we had a good team there. We had Savory there to help, and they they had some hospitality experience, but we didn't need that. If you're going to go look at another group and say, I really need a deep deep bench of experience because I don't have the experience or I don't have a team with that experience. You really got to look for a family office that has deep experience in food and beverage or a private equity firm that has done multiple deals in, in food and beverage and has deep experience on how to help you. If you're the first food and beverage investment for a private equity firm and you have big needs of what do I do next because I don't have the playbook on how to grow, you can't take their money. It doesn't matter what the value is. They're not going to help you. So now you're going to have money and no plan, no playbook, no help. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, I don't need the help. I just need money. Then they're going to be just fine. So there's a place for every private equity or family office investor in every ecosystem of, of brands or, or opportunity. It just, there's, you got to match them the right way. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, so credit. You want to talk about private that credit. one? Let's talk about private credit because I, I asked you a few months ago, like, what's the hottest thing? And you said private credit. Um, yeah. So what, what exactly is that? Private credit, it's interesting. So so banks, and I've always felt like, you know, cash, you always say, and you've heard before, cash is king, cash is king, cash is king. Personally, cash is king in business even more, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to have cash, be well capitalized. You have to have a balance sheet that actually has a positive number, not a negative number, you're toast, right? Like you're not going to survive unless you are, are capitalized the right way. One of the things that takes money from your system though, is that Sam, you and I own our smoothie shop and we want to go open up 10 of them and we can go borrow a bank loan for $5 million to build them. The problem is, is if we open them all and they take some time to get set up and then we have to hire the people and it takes a while to get to profitability and start generating cash flow. The problem with a bank is that the bank month one wants principal and interest on that $5 million. So principal, as you know, with the mortgage principal and interest, it's a good size payment, right? Mm -hmm. And on a business, it's a big payment. So now you're taking cash from your business, sending it out to a big principal and interest payment every month. When you do that, it's swallowing the cash flow from your business just to service the debt. Mm -hmm. Private credit got smart and said, well, what would be the value of not having principal go out the door, keep that money in the business, but pay more in interest where we're taking the risk to not being paid down, but we'll take the risk, but you're going to pay me more for that risk. So less money goes out, but it is higher interest rate. So to give you an example for the, view, the listeners too, to not confuse you, let's just say I were to tell you, Sam, well, our payment on our 10 smoothie shops is $50,000 a month, mm -hmm. but we're borrowing the money at 7% or 8%. But if I were to tell you, well, let's go pay 12%, you're like 12% interest, holy crap, that's so high, or 14% interest rate, you're over like, I feel like I'm being stupid by and like irresponsible taking that money on. But if I told you that the payment now was 18,000 a month, you would go, okay, wait a second. So 50 versus 18,000, that delta of cash is now sitting in your bank to make sure you're well capitalized until those businesses get footing, right? Mm -hmm. So private credit out there now is extremely interesting because they'll come in and a lot of times they'll refinance your debt out on the bank, charge you a higher interest rate, but then you get to keep the principal in the business to stabilize your business, grow your business and get to a point where then maybe you refinance them out once you get better cash flow in your business with a new lower term loan, you know, in lower interest rate loan. The problem right now too, there's so many private credit brand, uh, businesses out there and private equity funds and funds is because the interest rates are so damn high. Yeah. So yeah. private credit, I think, will be really, really hot for the next year and a half. And then when interest rates keep coming down, let's hope that they do, right, Sam, because that will help all of us. Yeah. But as the feds keep dropping those and then the banks catch up and we can start getting banks to lend again at lower interest rates, well, then refinance your private credit and then put yourself back in health. But paying high interest rates on principal and interest loans right now is swallowing cash flow. It's making brands anemic. Yeah. And if there's a hiccup, that's why we're seeing so many failures right now is because of the debt load or the cash flow issues that brands have. Cash flow is king. Mm -hmm. You got to remember that. Yeah. 
something else I want to unpack with you, something you said earlier and was something we explored last year at the Investment Summit, this idea of getting your house in order, um, which I think is so interesting. And you, you, you mentioned earlier in this conversation, this idea of just kind of the, the, your foundation as a brand needs to be strong before you raise. And that idea of getting your house in order, you know, lo lots of things I'm sure that means, but I'm wondering what that means to you as far as, you know, hiring, as far as, you know, paying off debts, whatever that might be, what is your suggestion as you work with founders on that, getting the house in order and what that could look like? Yeah, we always, we, we here at Savory, we always call it pause and perfect. And, mm. you know, we're in uh, board season. There's no secret uh, <laughs> to that, that we are in board season. We have board meetings at the beginning of the year and the middle of the year. And, you know, going through all of our portfolio companies, meeting with the founders, meeting with their leadership teams, we're talking about budgets, we're talking about growth, we're talking about team, team makeup, where we're growing, how we're doing. And every brand is different. And everybody out in the market, they're experiencing different things. We're in different markets and we have different teams and we're different life cycles of the brand. And so it's the same for Savory. We're sitting with some brands going, we're set. We have the team, we have the makeup, we have the, the cash. We have, we'll put in more cash, go, grow more because we have the opportunity, right? There's others in our portfolio we're saying, we need to pause, perfect, and get our house in order, even yeah. us. So he's like, oh, Savory has no issues. No, I'm in the same industry everybody else is in, and so we all deal with issues. But our issues are, do we grow seven or eight new units here for Via 313 this year, or do we do five? Because five will allow us to not have as much cash need, and we can pause and perfect on the brand or the stores we just opened, make those more healthy, and then make sure that we add the right people onto the team so that they were ready for the next bout of growth. Um, and that could, I could go through every brand and tell you that everyone's different. So getting your house in order means, do you feel like you're on stable footing? Is your foundation this way or is it this way or are you stable? And stable is, how are our units doing currently? Do we have any stores that are burning cash and not doing well? Do you clip that store? How is our team? Do we promote people to give them more responsibility because they're doing a great job? Do we? Do we take a size team that's 30 people above store and do we go to 27 people or 25 people? Because we're not getting as much out of every person on our team. Get your house in order because if you have people that are just boat anchors, get rid of your boat anchors. You can't ride your speedboat really fast, right? So house in order is all of those things. Brands have got to be got to be healthy. Above store leadership teams have got to be healthy. And before you, 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 I guess we're using the boat. So before you hammer down on that throttle, right, Sam? you got to make sure you have no anchors slowing you down. And that can be yeah. a store that's dragging you down. I had a conversation with a founder the other day with a great brand here locally. And he said, Andrew, I, I said, how are things going? He goes, you know, we're a little down in sales, a little down in traffic, but we're fighting for him. I'm like, good, good job. How are you doing on EBITDA and, you know, Sleebida? And he says, uh, you know, we're down on that too, but we're about the, you know, the, the mid to upper teens. I'm like, that's great. You're actually doing better than most. And he's like, oh, that's great. So I was encouraging him. He said, you know, the thing I'm thinking about though is I have a store that's just killing us. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, just we're losing money every month on it. And I'm like, well, how much? And he told me, and I'm just like, you got to cut that. You got to cut that out. I yeah. know that we've never shut down a store and everything. And I'm like, stop thinking that it's a badge of honor to have a boat anchor where if you shut it down, people think, oh, it's the brand's failing and what? That, who cares about any of that? Right. Like people will forget about it one week later, as you and I know, Sam, because that's a sound bite for people. And then the next day they don't care. Yeah. You have to make sure your house is in order. And I said, shut it down, eliminate that stress and that focus and focus on your, the health of your business. And he's like, oh my gosh, I just needed to hear that. I'm like, sometimes we need to be given permission sure. to do things that are hard, right, Sam? And so uh, I think with everybody listening is if we have struggling units or we have a struggle in our business with a, a human or a person that we thought was gonna perform better and they're not, start cutting out some of those things. They'll go find another option. And for these sites, they'll find a new tenant sooner or later. Yeah. It's painful, but they'll find a new tenant. You'll feel better if you just work on getting your house in order versus grow, 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 thinking that that's going to solve your problems. Yeah, that's good stuff. Andrew, we could talk about this stuff for hours, um, but I don't want to give it all away because I do want people to come to the Investment Summit to learn there as well. So I will tell everybody, and uh, if you want more from Andrew, if you want to learn more about um, the steps you should go through to uh, raise capital, to grow your business, um, go to create.nrn.com and uh, register for free um, to the Investment Summit and to create. You will not regret it. We're going to have a good time in Nashville. Andrew's there. I'm there. Lots more others will be there. Uh, Andrew Smith, Managing Partner of Savory Fund, as always, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, brother. 
That was my interview with Savory Fund's Andrew Smith. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my five takeaways. My first takeaway is it's better to be a speedboat in tumultuous waters than a cruise ship. I love the analogy of the speedboat. Andrew was using this analogy to talk about how in this economy with inflation the way it is, uh, for most restaurants out there, the waters are choppy. It's a tough, uh, it's a t- tough economic climate, especially if you're trying to grow. But he pointed out there are a lot of winners out there. There are a lot of brands that have their act together, that have smart systems and operations and people in place, and that they are growing. And those are the brands he compares to being speedboats. And what does he mean by that? He means that these brands are, they're nimble, they're gritty, they're fast, and they can evolve with whatever challenges are thrown their way. And he compares that to the cruise ship, which of course, you've probably heard that analogy before, takes a long time to turn a cruise ship around. You have a lot of these big brands that are old and dilapidated and maybe don't have their act together right now. And maybe they're really showing signs of age and they took take forever to turn around purely because of all of the systems that they've had in place for years and years and how big the size of the system is. So those speedboats are the ones that are cruising through these choppy waters. And that's why Andrew says it's better to be a speedboat than it is to be a cruise ship. And he also pointed out that Those speedboats, that's what investors are looking for. They're looking to invest in these brands that can be nimble, can be gritty, can be fast. They don't want to put their money behind a cruise ship that takes forever to change and is going to be a big, big project uh, that would take a long, long time to find any kind of success with. My second takeaway is that when raising money, you have to date around. Just like when you're out there looking for a partner uh, for the long term, so it goes with investors. You should date around. You should see who's out there. Andrew made the point that you don't want to just meet one person and settle down with them and call it a day. You want to meet somebody who meets your needs. You want to know their psyche. You want to get to know their um, you know, maybe their uh, personality a little bit, of course. Um, and that's the same with investors. Uh, know what questions to ask them. Know what they look for in, in investments. Know what kind of success they've had in the past. Um, what kind of brands are they looking to invest in? And are you a good fit for them? Uh, if you know your priorities, Andrew pointed out, if you know what it's going to take to take your company to the next level, you should play the field and find an investor who can provide that. Because if you do that, you you set yourself up for a better chance of success. By the way, that also means it doesn't have to be private equity. It can be uh, family office financing, or it could be debt financing. Whatever the solution for raising capital to grow your brand, Um, Take your time doing it. Understand what options are available to you. Get to know those investors who are out there and make your decision very, very carefully. My third takeaway is that you shouldn't try to time the market when you're raising money. I asked Andrew, you know, is now a good time to to raise money and, and, you know, based on the market and based on what we're seeing out there? And the point Andrew made was, you know, you shouldn't ever base your decision on what's happening with the market because you don't know what the market's going to do. Yes, we can make some general assumptions about you know, how things might change in the coming months. We know when the Fed could lower interest rates, for example. But you don't know when there's a pandemic around the corner or some other calamity that could uh, you know, shift the markets and shift what is available to you out there when you're trying to raise money. So don't time your capital raise on the market. Time it instead on your own capacity to grow and whether your business is in good shape and, and ready for that. Um, he does point out, Andrew pointed out in this conversation, now is a good time to grow. You know, comparing it to the Great Recession of 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, basically once you got out of the worst of the recession, The years of 2009, 2010, and on um, were a very good time to grow uh, because, you know, the market started to improve. And, and, you know, even though there were some conditions less favorable to restaurants, there were a lot of conditions that were very favorable. And if you were able to capitalize in that moment, you set yourself up for success for many years to come. Now is kind of like that time. If you compare it to that period, you know, we are out of the worst of what happened with the economy. Inflation is cooling down. We expect interest rates to come down. Andrew said himself in this interview, he thinks, you know, in about a year, we'll get to a better place uh, for the industry. Uh, but this could be a really good time to grow if you are prepared for that. 
that leads me into my fourth takeaway, which is you should make sure that your foundation is strong before you raise money. So all of this talk of timing and what you should do and, you know, whether this time is right for you, whatever, you know, it all depends on is your foundation strong? Andrew pointed out that you should have your house in order. Make sure you're the, the base of your business is strong. He says to smooth out the rough edges. All of that really means is build good systems, put good people in place. Uh, make sure that you have a good grasp on what your business needs and especially make sure that you're profitable. Make sure that you have good cash flow. Uh, Andrew threw a bunch of the numbers out there uh, in, in the interview. I'm sure you caught them and you can go back and listen to, you know, some of the points he, you know, he suggested to be at to where, you know, you've got good cash flow and good profitability um, before you raise. Uh, but, you know, all of that is to say is if you're heavily in debt already and if you're not turning a profit, um, now is not the time to go looking for more capital to grow. That's not going to rescue you. You've got to get your house in order um, in order to um, get to that place where investors will want to invest and where you can step on the accelerator for growth. So, again, now could be a good time for growth, but make sure that the fundamentals in your business are sound, make sure that your foundation is strong. My fifth and final takeaway is that you should cut loose any anchors on your speedboat before you hit the throttle. So going back to the speedboat analogy, this was again courtesy of Andrew, great analogy. You know, he says, if you want to hit that throttle and speed away, uh, you know, no matter the waters are choppy or not, um, make sure you can cut any anchors that are going to hold you back. And what he means by that is, if you have a, a restaurant that's underperforming and maybe you haven't been able to bring yourself to closing it, maybe you should. Maybe there's somebody on your team who is toxic and, and is preventing you from having a strong company culture. Maybe it's time to get rid of them. Point is, is that whatever's holding you back to being more profitable, to being in a better position for growth, make the tough decision. M do Get rid of the store, the person, whatever it is, and move on without that anchor holding you down because you're going to be better off for it. And thank yourself later down the road. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.okus at informa.com. Thanks again and talk to you next week. Blending up fun, freshly frozen beverages from shakes and smoothies to bowls and cocktails has never been easier than the For Real by Riches back of house blender. Simply grab a For Real by Riches frozen base cup Place it in a blender and press start for hands-free, mess-free blending in under a minute. Customize or serve it as is. It's that easy. Learn more about Frail by Riches at richesusa.com slash frail dash food service.